is this thing on? Hi. <laughs> Welcome to my channel. I'm Becca. And this is my houseplant channel where I'm very organized and start my videos in a way that makes you feel like we're just a couple of friends hanging out. <laughs> we're on FaceTime. <laughs> okay, so today I have some plant chores. I cannot position my camera in the right way. Whatever. Okay, so I have some plant chores to do. Mostly watering. I know, I know. But here's my thoughts on it. If I have to sit through hours and hours of watering my plants, so do you. <laughs> because I'm sure that I'm not the only one who has to water a lot of plants right now. Maybe there's been other people who are super neglectful to their plants over the, the winter holiday. I don't know. But today we're going to be answering some questions while I do it as well. So, all right, let's get started with that. I actually just finished watering my Thai constellation. She is so beautiful. This is definitely one of my most beautiful plants. It's just so striking and all of the leaves are growing like all right next to each other, which makes me very happy. It's just so cute. Now, anytime I have to water my like big plank plants, big plank plants, okay. I have to put my plant potty on the ground and then sort of lean the plank against the ladder, which is an unexpected perk of having the ladder. I didn't expect that, but it is hard to water these because the plank can be kind of top heavy and I like for them to be leaning on things because if it's not leaning on something, there's a chance that it'll fall over. And I don't like taking that risk ever because one time, actually in my October favorites video, I let a plant get a little wobbly and it snapped in half. Oh my gosh. I just ripped this off. Yay. It's not a very cute plant anymore and I'm really sad and it was one of my favorite plants in my collection. I only put this question box up a few minutes ago but we already have some really good questions. So first of all, when are you moving? What will you be looking for in a new house? Any new or specific wishes? So I don't know when I'm moving, but I know that it'll probably be sometime this year, late this year. It's not coming up anytime soon, so I don't want anybody to start stressing. <laughs> but when I do move, I will be doing some moving content. Um, but since I mentioned it, I get a lot of questions about it. I feel like anytime a YouTuber mentions a possible future life change, everybody's very curious, which I am too, so I get it. But yeah, I don't really have any details on it. I just know that it's probably coming. So I'm like mentally preparing myself. But as far as what we're looking for in the next place, it's hard to say because we're gonna be renting our next place. So I'd say our expectations are gonna be pretty low, to be honest. I wouldn't wanna rent a home with acreage because then I'm gonna wanna do things to it. And if it's a rental, it's like, it's not my house. So like, why would I? put that much effort. We also don't know if we're selling our current house. It's kind of up in the air. Everything is very up in the air. And I feel like I shouldn't even be talking about it because I literally don't have like good answers. Let's talk about like a future forever home then because my next place will probably be disappointing compared to this house, just to be completely honest. So future home, <laughs> forever home. I have been looking at like, I've been putting like very, very specific things into realtor.com. Like, you know, four bedrooms, three baths, has more than 10 acres, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, going through the filters and being very specific and then keeping it open to like an entire state. So I've looked at Minnesota, Michigan, in Wisconsin mostly, like those top three states, because we kind of want to settle somewhere a lot colder than Missouri. If we don't end up settling here, we, well, my husband really likes cold weather. I'm okay with it. I'm definitely adjusting and getting better with it. I think maybe our next place we live, we want to try somewhere colder to see how we do, like if we actually want to do that long-term. Um, because yeah, you, you honestly never know. And I wouldn't want to commit to like another mortgage if I hate living in constant snow cover in the winter. But right now it's, it looks like glorified fall. Like some of the leaves are still on the trees. We still have leaves on the ground. It's just like freaking cold, but you can't go out and enjoy it. You know what I mean? I mean, you could, if you dress properly for sure. Um, anyway, I think that we definitely want to live somewhere with more snowfall. It would be awesome in a future home to have like 
you know, more the acreage than we currently have, like 10 or more acres. Also would be great to have some sort of pond or water running through the property, stuff like that. If there was already a barn established, that'd be great. If there was already a garden area established, that would be really great. I don't know, we're kind of just imagining what that future home would look like. And we definitely like living a little bit more rural, but I like having the comforts of a city because I love Target. <laughs> And if I have to drive super far to get to a Target or anything like that, it's really such a bummer. But at the end of the day, you do have to sacrifice a lot when you want to live more rural. And I do quite enjoy it. So I think that we are going to continue in that direction. House feature wise, a sunroom is definitely a big need as like you can see this sunroom is like my entire personality and actually it's been something that's super common is there being like at least one room with a bunch of windows across the board from what i'm seeing on just like looking at realtor.com so i don't think that'll be that hard to find i don't really have a lot of like individual house requirements i'd love for the flooring to be updated already like i actually am thinking about making a video talking about on my second channel our experience with buying a house for the first time and going further than just the buying process like we bought a house it's a little older and it needed upgrades like what would we do differently next time i kind of want to make a video like that because we've learned a lot of lessons and we feel like when and if we do buy another house in the future we would make a lot of different decisions not that this experience has been horrible but we would definitely do things differently you know new knowledge or more knowledge makes better informed decisions so yeah <laughs> All right, admittedly, I took a lunch break after answering one question. That was hard work. <laughs> and you guys, look how bright it is in here. I have not had the sun shining like this in so long. The sun has just not come out. Oh my gosh, I missed the sun so much. I honestly, since moving here, I would never take for granted how amazing it is to have the sun shining into my house. It's incredible. I've got to put some plants back up on the wall here because they've been chilling on my ladder. This plant and this plant, I'm actually gonna water them real quick before I take them back. But these actually live underneath my TV stand and they've been under there for quite a while because they live under mother grow lights, which is a fantastic grow light. I worked with them a couple months ago, well, it's maybe it's like last March, I think. And these plants have grown so much. They are so happy under there. I just wanted to move them into the plant room for the Christmas holiday because I was gonna be out of town and I don't have a timer on those lights yet. So I just moved them in here so they could get sunlight. So hot tip, if you're moving, not moving, if you're going on a trip, and you have plants that always live under a grow light and they're not on a timer, I need to get them on a timer. I really do. But if you're in that situation, oh my gosh, I hate how Instagram just automatically will like blast you with sound as soon as you open the app. It's really the worst, I, I hate it so much. But <laughs> let me get the next question here. Tips to increase plant knowledge and how to become an expert. What I would say for increasing your plant knowledge is to look to a variety of sources. I always say that uh, my channel should never be your singular source of plant knowledge. Number one, because I'm not a botanist or a horticulturalist. I've never claimed to be, I don't want to be. And I don't say that because they are the only people who have valid things to say about houseplant care. But I say that because they're the ones who are actually doing the research, like the field research and writing the papers and creating resources for people like me to look at and break it down further for people like you or even for people like myself, really. I, I make videos that I would like to watch and I create content, especially educational content, in a way that I would understand it. I do have a background in education, so I feel like I am pretty good at reading information and synthesizing it in a way that makes it more palatable. Definitely find people online who teach in a way that you understand, 
or you enjoy watching them do things. Maybe they're not necessarily always teaching, but I would say grab one or two houseplant care books. I wrote one obviously, well, maybe not obviously if you didn't know, I, I wrote a houseplant care book. It is called Houseplants for Beginners and it really is like a true beginner's guide. If you're beyond the super beginner stage, it might feel a little bit basic to you. I have seen some reviews that say that, but that's literally the point. It's houseplants for beginners. <laughs> Um, but I have heard a lot of people say that there was new concepts in the book that they hadn't heard someone else talking about. A couple other people who wrote really great books, there's Daryl Chang, he wrote The New Plant Parent, and then Danae Horst, she wrote House Plants for All. Those are two really great resources that I really like. They both have really great illustrations. I also have some vintage houseplant books that I look at just to see how information has evolved because honestly, like if it worked in the 70s, it would probably still work now. So I kind of like going back and seeing sort of what they did. And it's also really beautiful just to look at vintage houseplant books. I have a stack like right here. And then I have another one underneath that right here. And I have an old series on my channel where I actually look through those books. It's called Plant Advice From slash like vintage plant advice. So I have a couple, I think maybe two or three videos where I've flipped through uh, a vintage houseplant book and shared what the pages look like and some information in them. Those were some of my favorite videos to film, but they get like barely any views. Unfortunately, I do have to think about the content that actually gets views um, in addition to content that I really enjoy making. So I kind of try to sprinkle in both when I can, but anyway, those videos usually tank. So I kind of stopped doing them, but maybe in the future I will make more <laughs> as like a bonus episode or something. Also Maria from the Growing Joy podcast, formerly known as Bloom and Grow Radio has a like a network basically a, a learning network i like to say where she has um leslie halleck who is a botanist or a horticulturist or maybe both i'm i'm not remembering um and she does a lot of like ask a horticulturalist events with leslie halleck and like q a's and stuff like that and honestly a lot of my plant knowledge came from um, early episodes of bloom and grow radio now known as growing joy because it was one of the only informative plenty podcasts at the time and it's a really good podcast obviously so i enjoy maria she's one of my friends now which is wild to think about but that's another great resource um there's classes on skillshare if you want to do a more like classroom environment type of thing i had a code with skillshare and i don't know if it's still active but if it is i'll put it in the description box if you want to try that out but there's a lot of classes on skillshare plant queen actually has christopher griffin plant queen has a couple of classes on there too and she's awesome i love listening to their content and everything else different people will have different philosophies for how they care for plants and i think that it's good to listen to a bunch and then from all of that create your own we are getting to the top of my plant wall and these plants <laughs> They look rough, but it's nothing a good pair of shears can't fix. I've got lots of leaves that are like, oh dear, very dead. But surprisingly, this plant looks pretty good. That was only two leaves that I had to cut off. I could technically do maybe like two more, but I'm gonna leave them because they look fine. So, okay, these are the plants that I have not watered in literally a couple, like probably a month at this point, to be honest. This whole watering process and like getting back into the watering routine after the holidays has taken me so long that this spider plant was one of the first plants that I watered when I came home. It's already thirsty again. So it's been at least like a week and a half, two weeks of me <laughs> trying to get back into my routine. Um, what can I say? I'm having deja vu because I just did a video super similar to this talking about my 2021 goals. I hope that these videos aren't too similar, but hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, quickly, planting straight into terracotta versus a nursery pot, what do you recommend? It depends on the plant. So if it's like anything from the Marantesia family, so prayer plants, Calathea, Gapersha, there's a couple other within that umbrella, but those I would not plant into terracotta. Like I do have one planted in terracotta right now, and I've done it a few other times and it just usually doesn't go very well. <laughs> the one that I have in terracotta is in a place 
that I go all the time so I'm able to watch after it and look at it quite often so if it does get thirsty I, I can like water it pretty quickly but yeah generally I'm gonna say not a good idea to put those in terracotta ferns or anything that needs like a lot of moisture because terracotta is made to be like it's porous clay so it's supposed to be water wicking and it's supposed to dry out quickly so I wouldn't suggest it for those types of plants but pretty much every other plant I would suggest it there was some discourse a couple years ago about putting Hoya in terracotta because um, the roots will grow into the terracotta and this isn't something that only Hoya will do other plants I've noticed do this as well like I've noticed that anthurium can sometimes get like really um, suctioned to the terracotta because the terracotta is sucking in moisture from the soil so there's moisture like obviously in the pot until it dries so the roots are attracted to that so definitely just when you're repotting out of terracotta be careful that you're not just like haphazardly ripping roots out because sometimes they can get attached um, you can also just like soak the pot in water for I don't know maybe an hour or so before you repot the plant and that should help loosen things up but most generally pretty much everything can be planted in terracotta um, sometimes you might have to water things more often but most of my collection is in terracotta a lot of my plants are not up on the wall right now which is usually where i would point to be like look <laughs> but yeah lots of my stuff is in terracotta and most things are happy i think that if i switched to more ceramic or glazed pots i would have to water less maybe i would complain less about watering in general <laughs> yeah most generally it is the most cost effective pot and it looks nice too they're not ugly necessarily i guess it depends on what you consider ugly but you can get like cool looking terracotta like for example this is a terracotta pot that's seemingly pretty basic but it has some cute like ridges and design a little bit um, as compared to something a little bit more basic like this one like you know there's a little bit more of a design with the this one lots of artists have come out with really cool i have some examples okay this one i got from a shop in Chicago and I don't remember what it's called but if you watch my Chicago plant shopping video you'll find this pot in it and last year I planted hyacinths in it and it was so cute and I think it'd be really cute for a house plant too but I kind of like having an annual flower in it and then these are from front range clay these are some of my favorite terracotta pots because it's a four inch pot and it has these three rings right here and if you use the pot clips that I use up on my wall these will fit perfectly and it's sometimes hard to find like handmade pottery like this or, or like let's say specialty made pottery that has a lip on it where I could put it up on my wall so that's why I bought two of these because I am planning on filling this wall up and I might buy more honestly I think they're like 30 or 34 dollars each somewhere in that range and yeah I, I really like them so terracotta doesn't have to be just like the burnt orange basic bell shape you can get lots of different forms of it This plant has been thirsty for weeks, even before I left on my trip. And I'm honestly really surprised that it bounced back so well, but it did. And I'm just, I'm very happy about it. But I'm just gonna go through and pull off dead leaves or vines if I see them because it is, well, I was gonna say this is normal, but this amount is probably not normal, but it looked pretty much dead like I honestly thought I lost it so I am glad to see that I didn't but it needs to be repotted pretty badly into a bigger pot with some better soil because I can just tell that this soil is pretty spent it looks gross and it stinks so <laughs> I feel like the soil is done my exposure is all over the place we're very confused with the sun streak and then trying to focus on my face at the same time it's not easy it's not easy for my camera. Okay, now this plant actually lives in 
this macrame hanger that I made with my podcast co-host. In the last episode of Potted Together, we have discussed this so many times on our podcast <laughs> that we had a, oh my gosh, Leo, getting comfy. Uh, we've discussed so many times on our podcast that we have this YouTube video that we were gonna film of us doing a macrame tutorial and the footage, long story short, Adam's footage was too big of files for my internet to be able to download. There was like maybe five or six videos, I don't remember, and each of them was taking like six hours each to download. It was just a mess. Every time my computer would even get kind of close to downloading it, it would fail and it was just so annoying. And um, anyway, <laughs> it's the lost YouTube video. So it lives in this macrame piece up in this corner over here. Not every plant did well with my neglect, so. She's returned to her glorious macrame throne. Now this plant looks super bad. I don't know how well this one is going to do. However, begonia, cane begonia, typically bounce back for me after neglect, but I don't, this one, the maculata has been a little bit of a pill. I'm gonna be honest. We've lost quite a bit of this plant. Best book you read in 2022. One of them was Every Summer After, which is an incredible book. It's a romance, but it's a little bit more than just romance. Like it's about childhood friendship and what that looks like as an adult as well. It's like a dual perspective. So you're seeing the characters when they were young and then that's contrasted with the characters as adults, which I think is one of my favorite kind of like, I don't think that's a trope, but it's like one of my favorite styles of book in that realm. I just think that it's really nice. Second one was A Far Wilder Magic. And A Far Wilder Magic is a YA. Well, YA is just young adult fiction. And the reason that I love YA so much is because it sort of transports you back to being a kid reading a book. Like, it's just simple. Life is just simple as a young adult reader. I don't know. And what I find with YA is they they touch on a lot of, not controversial topics necessarily, but I mean, yes, yeah, sometimes, but they touch on, let's say important topics. I like the word important more than controversial because I don't know, it's like topics of identity and family, friendship, and growing up, coming into yourself, um, coming of age. Like people love a coming of age story and so much of YA is coming of age. Anyway, so in this book of Far Wilder Magic, we see two characters that are from groups that have been historically ostracized by society. Um, it's a like religious cultural groups. And it's really interesting to see like a coded version of that in this world. And there's like, you know, supposed mythical creatures involved and it's just really interesting uh, to look at it as like an adult knowing what these groups were coded as like what they are in real life application and then just like as a reader um, hearing their stories and I don't know I just think that those kinds of stories are really important to read it grows empathy and um, as a kid you might not understand like fully what's going on but it does help you to grow empathy for groups that might be ostracized um, or treated differently based on you know the way they look or what they believe and things like that so that was a great book and there was one more that keeps coming to mind every time i think about this and it's called fable and it's basically about a girl who it's, it's like a like a pirate core book and it's also YA, so I love YA. She's the daughter of someone important who was left on an island because it was the safest place for her. And it's basically just about like her journey to meet her dad. And you know, they're on the ocean a lot, they're working and just like life as kind of like, I wouldn't consider them pirates necessarily. I guess maybe they would be, but anyway it's pirate core and it's really good. And that's also about identity and um, like coming coming of age. And there's a little bit of romance in that too, of course. I love a book that has a little bit of romance and so does A Far Wilder Magic. You guys don't ask me questions about books because I will literally go on and on. I love to talk about books. <laughs> I got a degree in English literature.
So I love to talk about books. <laughs> All right, we've got more crusty leaves to cut away. This one is pretty bad. This plant looks terrible. I don't know. I'm going to see what this looks like after it perks back up. I hope that it looks better than it currently does because it looks really bad. I might move this down further on the wall so that I can pay more attention to it because with it being so high up, I don't think that I'm able to meet its needs. Um, it's a philodendron brantiatum and I just find that it has, oops, I just cut off a good leaf. Darn it. I just find that it has a little bit higher need compared to other like vining philodendron, which is fine, but um, if it's not right in my face, I'm gonna forget about it. We're gonna put her right there and see, hopefully, how she does. I've got my Epipremnum pinnatum up front and center. We're going more towards the back of the room now. I'm almost done with the plant room, which is very encouraging. Okay, what is your favorite interior design style, vibe, example, mid-century modern, boho, etc.? Okay, the two that you mentioned are actually the ones that I probably identify with the most in my home. Although sometimes, I don't know. Mid-century sometimes, I mean, as ironic as this sounds, sometimes it feels a little bit too modern for me. Like the clean lines and all of that, um, sometimes it doesn't feel very me and I kind of gravitate more towards like Victorian vintage vibes. Like if you guys watch Exo McKenna, pretty much her style is my style for her cottage. Her LA home is I think a little bit more coastal as she shared. <laughs> Oh, I watch way too many of her videos that I know all of this, but yeah, her California vibe is a little bit more coastal, obviously, but her Texas house, pretty much everything she's done is my vibe. She goes a little bit more moody than I do. I tend to not gravitate towards such dark colors, but I am noticing that spaces that are like supposed to be really cozy, like bedrooms and yeah, mostly just bedrooms. <laughs> I tend to gravitate towards a, a darker color palette. Like my bedroom used to be, well, we've never painted our bedroom. Uh, it's currently like a grayish color, but I have no plans to paint it like a white or anything like that, but I have painted most of my house white. Just with the nature of my house, it is so, so dark. It's partially built into the ground. So like it's a basement for a lot of the house. So I, I wanted to have it be really bright. And some people would really lean into like the moodiness of that, but I, I can't, I, I need brightness because um, otherwise I get really bad seasonal affective disorder, which I learned my first year living here. And in that first year I painted like all of my most commonly used spaces white, which is fine, you know, it's fine, but I would like to incorporate a little bit more color. As far as the plant room, it's very boho, like I love rattan. I'm kind of sad to hear that that whole thing is going out of style. <laughs> I feel like in the plant context, it'll always look good though, because it's very natural. Like I love natural materials, so I don't ever see myself having like an industrial or like modern plant aesthetic like ever. I really like my art shelf and like my cane and rattan furniture. I really like it a lot. But for my personal life, maybe a little bit more vintage with mid-century touches. Like I, I, I like the collective thrifted, floral, whimsical look. I don't really know how to explain my style. And I think that's a big reason why I have such a hard time decorating my home because if I decided, okay, I like mid-century modern, then I would just go all out on mid-century. Um, but it's, yeah, it's kind of hard when I like a lot of different things and I'm trying to figure out how to marry those things together. It's hard. Like as far as like big furniture pieces, I love mid-century. Uh, mid-century modern. I have actually some like vintage mid-century like pieces upstairs in my bedroom, my dresser, and well, I have a couple of dressers and a bed up there that are like real mid-century pieces. And I just think they're beautiful and I would not want to have like a modern version of that or even more like a Victorian-y version of that. Like I really like the clean lines of mid-century, but I, I like adding like whimsy. I don't know. I'm on a constant journey to figure out what my style is. I feel like my life would be a lot easier if I did know it because then I could just like decorate and not feel so overwhelmed every time I have to decorate. What about you guys? What is your style? What would you describe your style as? Are you more mid-century, boho, modern? What kind of design style do you vibe with? And bonus question with that, is it different 
in your plant aesthetic spaces. Like, do your plants have a sort of different aesthetic vibe than the rest of your house? Let me know. Okay, you guys, this Hoya uh, Callistophylla triple bloomed right before I left for uh, Christmas at my parents' house. And I was so excited about it that I kept forgetting to take a picture. Does that sound a little bit ridiculous? Yes, for sure. But I was just so excited looking at it. <laughs> Like every time I'd see it, I was just like so enthralled with how beautiful the triple bloom was that I just never even thought to get my phone or my camera out, which I regret. But also, I know that I got to experience it to the fullest, so a photo is fine to not have. Like I don't, I don't need the photo. I got to experience it. But I would have loved to be able to show you guys because it was really beautiful. Also, my water thing here, my planta potty is getting so full. And okay, I got a ton of questions on my last video in this format asking what the green lid was on my watering thing. And it's called a planta potty. It's a really cool invention by uh, one of our community members and podcast listeners. So they do restocks on Etsy every couple of weeks, I think. So if you follow them on Instagram, you will know when they're updating because they don't have a constant stock. Um, it's a 3D printed, situation so obviously that takes time to print and make and they're just really awesome they have so many fun designs they're so inventive always coming up with new new ways to make watering your plants easier and i just really appreciate this i mean i do water like different sections in my house differently and i do typically use the planta potty for the plant room when i'm doing like smaller watering sessions when i'm doing bigger watering sessions i use the plant watering table that I built last year because uh, I can water like up to six large plants on that one at a time and with this it's more like smaller plants or like two bigger plants at a time so that's a little bit more time consuming when I'm doing large plants but I really like it for smaller watering sessions and it's a it fits on a five gallon bucket so I don't have to empty it very often quick one while I wait for these two empty out because I do need to empty it. Um, what are your thoughts on buying duplicate plants? I think that buying duplicate plants is, in some circumstances, I think it's really fun because if you have a plant that you really like, like for basic plants, I think definitely duplicate plants is great. Like I have uh, multiple spider plants and I don't see any issues with that because they're very easy to care for. But if I was having like duplicate plants of like, I don't know, like a harder to take care of plants, like if I had like two El Choco Reds, I'd be like, do I need both of these? And what I would probably do in that situation is pot them together. If I wanted to keep both of them, I would just combine them. Or maybe if I was coming to a point where I needed to like thin out my collection, I would sell one of them. I do have three variegated Monstera Deliciosa, which is, it's a lot, I know. I have a Thai constellation and then I have two albos, but the albos are so different from each other. Like it feels like they're completely different plants, but again, like it's a duplicate that I have and I do realize it's a bit redundant, but I like them both for different reasons. So I'm gonna keep them. So I think that if you have a connection to your duplicate plants, that's totally fine. There's really, there's really nothing wrong with it if you have the space for it. But if you are noticing that your space is like super crowded and really unpleasant to be in, and you have a lot of duplicates, maybe it's time to consolidate them or get rid of the one that you don't like as much because surely out of the two of your duplicates, there is one that's more of a favorite. So you can kind of decide from there. Wow, it is actually so warm in here with the sun shining in and I've been running the um, stove all day, like the wood burning stove. It's been so <laughs> warm. Look at this plant. It, it really needs to be propped up. It really needs it. Somebody asked what plants are gonna be moving out to the greenhouse. And I feel like a lot of my like philodendron like this, like my project philodendron, I have like a squammy farm upstairs that I need to water. Yikes, I need to water all my plants upstairs too. We'll do that in a video together sometime. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like uh, a lot of my squammy, I mean, a lot of my philodendron will probably go out there so they can get put on planks. 
Um, my big mama Monstera is gonna go out there so she can finally like crawl and like do what she's always wanted to do. That'll free up so much space in here. I love having her here, she's beautiful, but I think she'd be so much happier out there. <sighs> she definitely would get watered more often because that's like the one thing that I really struggle with with her is making sure she gets watered often enough. I don't wanna talk about it. <laughs> I don't. Did you buy a new Petonia yet? No, I haven't. It's actually still sitting here. Like the carcass is still here. I really need to throw it away, like really bad. It would free up a lot of space on this table here. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't even been to a plant shop lately. Like I did go to one to like meet somebody really quick, but then I didn't get anything. I just kind of walked around and got the vibes. I picked up a pot, but that's it. So yeah, I definitely would like to go plant shopping. I really wanna to go to Vintage Hill sometime soon because not that I need anything, but they always have really good Hoya. And as you guys know, I'm wanting to look into Hoya this year, hopefully smaller ones so that I can put them on this top row up here. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm thinking about going shopping and they usually have Fetonia. So if they have the type of Fetonia that I like, I will get it and maybe a couple because I would like to use this Fetonia bowl again. <laughs> I don't know how it's gonna go with like several plants. I hope that eventually they would grow all to look like one plant together like my original beautiful baby did. But yeah, new year, new Fetonia, you guys. And okay, this question is going to require a long answer. So buckle up. So it says, have you ever done a no buy kind of thing? Advice for trying to not be financially unstable because of plants. I feel like I should do an entire video dedicated to like this specific topic. I have made videos in the past where I talk about like the finances of houseplants, like how much I spent in a year on plants. For example, I did a video, I think maybe at the end of 2020 or 2021 on that. And I've also made a video talking about why I don't agree with plant bans. What it really comes down to is diet culture, which I might sound a little weird in this context, but I don't like plant bans because it feels very similar to diet culture. You know that like buying plants is not a smart decision right now, or let's say not good for you. If we're gonna talk in diet terms, not good for you. Um, so you just stop cold turkey, right? So like you love eating chocolate, but you never allow yourself to eat chocolate ever. So you love buying plants, but you've realized that you've gone to a point where you have too many, so no more buying plants ever again. Or for three months, you're not gonna buy plants. Well, what usually happens at the end of a diet or at the end of the plant ban is you have thought about chocolate the entire time because you're not allowed to eat chocolate or you've thought about buying plants the entire time. You Maybe you're even making a list of all the plants that you wanna buy uh, because you wanna buy plants so bad, but you're limiting yourself and that list gets really, really long. So at the end of the plant ban, you're like, all right, let's go shopping and get all of these plants. And at the end of the diet or however, you know, I mean, do diets really have an end? I feel like some, we just decide not to do it anymore. <laughs> um, and so at the end of that period of time where you were dieting, you eat like a ton of chocolate. And so, Obviously that's not for everybody and diet is, dieting is like a very sensitive topic. I'm not, I don't wanna trigger anybody. But the point is I look at buying plants and being financially smart with plants as I look at eating. So I'm more of an intuitive eater. Um, I don't limit myself to not having ice cream if I've had a lot of ice cream lately. If I want ice cream, I'm gonna eat it. And that makes me not want ice cream all the time because I know that I can have it at any time. So with plant bans, if you're telling yourself that you can't buy plants, it makes you wanna buy them so much more. So what I think is a good thing to do is to budget yourself a certain amount of money each month to have towards plants. And if the plants that you wanna buy are more than that budget, then you're just gonna to have to save up for a couple of months for the plant you want or the plant supply you want. Most things in plants are not urgent like you don't need to go out and buy something right away unless it's like a pesticide and those are like five bucks maybe ten bucks at most you know what i mean so those are things that you'll probably have in your budget but yeah i can make a video and talk more about budgeting with plants and like having hobbies and all of that kind of stuff i will say i'm not like 
I'm definitely not an expert at it because my, uh, my hobby turned into a job and so now I can kind of buy plants more often if I want, which I definitely fell into a hole of buying a lot of plants just because I could and then realized like, wow, this is not a good financial decision for me. So I can definitely make a video and talk more about that. Like if we want to do like a Q and A specifically about the finances of plants, that might be fun. I don't really know what else I could talk about besides like why I don't do plant bans, why you shouldn't let plants like destabilize your financial comfort. I don't really know what word to use there. But yeah, I've talked a lot about shopping addictions being masked by buying plants or like shopping addictions being covered by buying plants because buying plants is like a, a good thing. Like it's fun, it's, it's good for our homes, it's good for us, like we're bringing nature inside. Uh, but sometimes like people actually do have shopping addictions and can't control themselves. And then, you know, because they think they're buying something good, it kind of justifies the habit. So anyway, there's so much within the topic and I can definitely try to make a completely dedicated video to the topic. Just let me know and I will put together like a Q&A box on Instagram and people can ask and then I'll make a video specifically about that. Okay, so I think I'm gonna leave it at that because the sun is like, more than half of my body now and I feel like I don't, if I was watching, I don't know if I would like this. I don't know. We will see in editing if this is horrible. But anyway, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and getting more plant chores done, which was just watering. So I know that's not always like the most entertaining thing in the world, but it's what needs to be done and I'm not gonna, like it's come to the point where I just don't do it because I'm like, I've already filmed so much of me doing this. So there's no point in me doing it if I can't film it, which is like a terrible mindset. But unfortunately that is just the mindset <laughs> that I have gotten into. Plus it's really hot in here. So I'm gonna go hang out um, upstairs where the heater, where the stove is not running. And hopefully it's not so hot up there. Maybe I'll step outside. Cause like I am sweating in my sweater vest. <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video and hanging out with me and submitting questions. There's definitely gonna be more rolling in, so I might do a part two or I might answer more of them on Instagram. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, I will have my handle right here. It's De La Plants. And I'm also on TikTok if you wanna follow me on TikTok. It's a little bit more sporadic, mostly life, sometimes plants, whatever. TikTok is just a weird app and I'm I'm not used to it. So we're I, I enjoy it as a user, but as a creator, I'm like, I don't really know what to do with this. So um, if you want random content, you can follow me on TikTok. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.